Welcome to the show, everyone. I am super excited to have Steve Rosenbaum on today's episode of the New Construction Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Anya Christianton. Steve is an automated, uh, automation specialist uh, mentoring thousands worldwide to create massive income through his training programs. Steve is also an author of dozens of books and training programs, and he's been featured in publications such as New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, CBS News, and many more. So welcome to the show, Steve. I'm so excited to have you here. And uh, I am excited to be here, and I thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's kick things off. Um, per usual, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your um, journey through your career, how did you end up where you are now? <laughs> I often ask myself that question. <laughs> don't we all? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You, you know, um, I, I worked in the corporate world for close to 30 years, 25 to 30 years. And um, in, in, as a executive, a sales and marketing executive, and really one of the things I embraced very early on in my career that helped me with my success was um, really marketing automation, the, the, the whole sales and marketing process, and how I could use that to better qualify, better find, and close more sales. And I'm talking about starting that way back in 1986, um, even using CRMs and things and tools back in those days that were a whole lot different. For instance, I, I had a Macintosh Plus computer with a little nine inch black and white screen and I, I paid a lot of money to double the RAM. I had one whole megabyte of RAM on that computer. Which wow, is a, you, know, a <laughs> you don't exactly. say. <laughs> I had a 20 megabyte hard drive. I spent a fortune for that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's too funny. So it sounds like you've been a marketing professional from get-go, is, um, is that how you started off as a marketing professional? You, sales and marketing, it, you, you, it, it's one of those things where you can say it's in the blood. Really, my whole family is that way. And uh, my brother and I invented a, a game when I was in college and, and we sold it. And uh, Wow, you know, what game? Uh, it was a baseball trivia game called Cub Mania because I'm from Chicago. I'm a big Chicago Cubs fan. Mm -hmm. uh, so we sold Cub Mania in 1984, which was two things happened in 1984. Uh, number one, uh, that was the first year that the Cubs went to the, the, the championship, the, the National League pennant since 1945, 39 years. That was a big deal for Chicago. The other thing was a, a, a trivia game came out called Trivial Pursuit. Mm -hmm. Both those things happened in 1984. So my, my brother and I took those things, we married it together, and we developed this, uh, this game, and we had a lot of fun selling it until the Cubs lost. <laughs> Aw, <laughs> bummer. <laughs> <laughs> those Cubs, huh? They got to put a those name Cubs. on it. <laughs> That's right. That's pretty crazy. So you've uh, been kind of an entrepreneurial spirit from our early age. Where did yes, you go to school? A absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you go to school in Chicago? Well, I grew up in Chicago. I went to high school in, in Chicago, and I went to the University of Iowa in Iowa City. It's a Big Ten school. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I went to college. Okay, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I went to Penn State, so it's, you know. All... Also a Big Ten school. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't then, but it is now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So then um, after you graduated, you started off in a sales and marketing role. And um, how, like, what's been your progression in your career from one to the other? Well, as I mentioned, I, I did have a lot of success in that sales and marketing role. And, and really, I can attribute it to, to my first boss, my first trainer. I was with the Samsonite Luggage Company. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that introduced me to CRMs. And well, you know, we did a lot of work those days in spreadsheets, but I also used the X CRM. But what I did was I developed follow-up systems. I developed processes. That that to me is what's been the key to my success. And, and I had a lot of success and, and got recognized. And frankly, I got hired away from, to many different companies. I, I progressed pretty rapidly and moved from coast to coast and industry to industry and helped. I, every time I came to a company, I would help them embrace these systems and they would, get, they would get fast success because what they would realize is their sales processes needed help. It wasn't about the automation. It was about the process. The automation just helped us do it better, faster, and cheaper. Mm -hmm. And Steve, for those listening who are maybe not familiar with uh, some of the industry jargon, so CRM, what does it stand for? <laughs> it's, a, it's a customer relational management system. 
Um, they change it every once in a while, but I think uh, that's uh, it's it's yeah, a client thing. management, so something like that, client yeah. relationship management, right? Contact relation management, customer relation. It's a database. It's a, it's a, many companies do not get the most out of their CRM systems. They use it like a like a glorified Rolodex or an index file just to really store mm -hmm. the names and contacts information. They can be very powerful tools, but really many people don't use them the right way. As I said, it's really more about the process than it is about the tool. Mm -hmm. I think you're so dead on with this. Um, I think there's a lot of talented salespeople out there, but talent is almost has nothing to do with the sales success unless you have a system. So I am definitely big on systems. I think if you just spend a little bit of time in the beginning and figure out the process to put into place, and then you can kind of, you know, you know, uh, let go of the pedal and the bus is still driving itself. Yeah, so exactly right. It's, uh, and especially with salespeople, the way we are, I think a lot of us lack um, the discipline. Um, you know, obviously follow up is a big part of it that uh, most salespeople don't love. Um, and it's obviously essential part of success. And a lot of people lack the discipline because especially as a sales and marketing professional for new construction, you get so busy. Like I remember before I started in the position, I thought like, oh my gosh, wouldn't I be so bored at the model home? Like, what am I going to do with myself? You know, it's basically going to be like Ben a White, like here's the countertop, here's the cabinet. Do you like this? You know, and obviously completely it was wrong about the whole scenario because you know I, I always start off my day with 10 to-do list you know items on my list and when I leave um, it's more like 30 so right. <laughs> there's never a dull moment and you know your day can be stolen from you so quickly just with existing customer follow-ups especially if you're involved in making selections um, there's obviously no shortage of problems that come up with builds so you're constantly kind of trying to keep the ship afloat, but at the same time, you need to be prospecting and following up with existing customers. So if you can put those systems in place, that will make your life so much easier. And it sounds like that's kind of like what you're passionate about, and that's where you figured out a way to do it. And it sounds like you're attributing a lot of your sales success due to this process. Is that right? Well, it is. In, in fact, uh, can I tell a quick story? Please do. That's what okay. we're here for. <laughs> fact, hang on, I'll show you. This was, um, this, is, this is a book called, So What Do You Do? Volume 2. And it's by New York Times bestselling author, Joel Kahn. And I'm one of the featured authors in here. And I have a story in here in the back, and it's called The Perfect Sales Storm. And if you, if you don't mind, I'd like to tell you that story, because I think it sums up exactly what we're, we're speaking about. Please do. Uh, as I mentioned, so this was early on in my sales career, and I was in the luggage industry. This happened to be not Samsonite, but a, a company that hired me away from Samsonite and promoted me to um, uh, a regional manager. And when I first got the position, even though it's a different industry, I think it kind of sums up exactly what we're talking about. When I first got the position, I was eager to prove myself. I was eager to show people that I could sell and so forth. And I contacted a buyer of a department store in, in Quincy, Illinois, which is about six hours away from where I live. Mm -hmm. And the buyer was very nice. And she said to me, hey, Steve, it's nice to talk to you. And I asked her if I can come down and meet with her. And she said, you're welcome to come down, but it's a long trip. And I could save you some time because I want you to know that we've got a very deep relationship with a different company. And um, your chances of selling me are virtually zero. She told me flat out, you're just, you're not going to sell me. Uh, but I'm young and I'm stubborn and, and, and eager to prove myself. So I made the trip and I went down there anyways. And I got down there, six hour drive each way, nothing in between. And she comes out and she introduces me and walks me back, introduces herself to me and walks me back to her office. We sit down, I start demonstrating luggage. And uh, she says, you know, it looks very nice and I thank you. But as I mentioned, I've got this relationship with the, the other company. And as she's saying those very words, her phone rings. Now, this was 1980-something, um, no caller ID, you know, nothing. She, she picks up the phone. She says, excuse me. She picks up the phone, and I can hear the one side of the conversation. She says, oh, that's not good. She says, oh, no, th this really puts me in a lot of trouble. 
And she's okay, thank you. I'm going to have to do something else. And she hangs up the phone and she turns to me and she says, well, that was your competitor and their shipment of luggage that I need for an ad is hung up in customs. It's not going to get here in time for the ad. She said, can you sell me about $75,000 worth of luggage? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I said, excuse me one second. Let me go check my inventory. I called the VP of sales who's ecstatic. I mean, I've been in the job like a week, right? And, um, and so he thinks I'm the world's greatest salesman in the whole world. I'm writing this order for $75,000. It's a lot of luggage uh, in those days. And, and I got the order. And so I was young, I was cocky, and I, and I too thought, well, this just proves that I am the world's greatest salesman in the, in the whole wide world. As I tell that story, I think everybody realizes it wasn't that I was good, it was that I was lucky. You know, I, I happened to be at the right place at the right time and I had the right message. And that's when the sale happens. Those three things have to happen. You gotta be at the right place, the right time with the right message and actually speaking to the right person. You gotta have four things happen. And all those things, the, that's why I call it the perfect sales storm. All those things happened to come together and I was real lucky. Now, fast forward a few years and, and, uh, and, you know, and I started realizing that there was more to sales than just uh, getting lucky. And, um, and when I was struggling a little bit and I tried to think through this, I said, okay, well, remember how that happened back in that sale. And that's what I came up with. I was at the right place at the right time with the right person, the right message. How can I make that happen more regularly? What kind of system can I put into place? And so it came down to developing these processes that qualified people better. All right. So I knew where those hot situations were. Then I could simply show up and be in that hot situation and I'd close more sales. I'd be speaking to the right person at the right time with the right message. And I wouldn't have to get lucky. I'd kind of make my own luck, luck if that makes sense. Absolutely. So let me ask you this, going off your story. So yes. you talk about the, the right person, right? Yes. So it um, comes down to your customer, knowing your customer. So do you have any tricks that would help us to figure out who our customers are and where do they hang out? Ha, ah, that's a great question. Um, and, and, and actually the biggest trick and biggest tip that I have is asking questions. I meet a lot of salespeople, they don't ask enough questions. They, they, their, their sales presentation is very one directional. Um, I had a, I had somebody that I worked with who once called it a show up and throw up. You get there and you just start spewing information and you're not gathering back any information. So when I speak with somebody, you'll hear me asking many more questions. I, I try to make it a rule where I'm talking no more than 10% of the time, because if I'm doing that, I'm asking the right questions and in asking those questions and then shutting up and listening, I'm going to get those answers. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not, and, and I also have those opportunities built into my sales processes. For instance, we can gather a lot of information if we're marketing the correct way. We can gather information about who our people are. Uh, you know, are they, you know, it, it, it might matter. It might matter. Are, you know, what stage of their life are they? Are they buying their first home? Or are they looking to get a bigger home because their family's growing? Or are they looking to downsize because there are now empty nesters? I know these are all important questions to the home builders. And obviously, these are things that, uh, you know, the salesperson is going to ask. But it's possible we can even get this information and divine this information from our marketing processes. And in doing so, we could have very tailored, specific messages. And I know you and I spoke a little bit before we got online about how to be very personal with your messages. And people get afraid of automation that it, it's going to be robotic. But if we know what stage these people are in, we can tailor our messaging to them. And if we're, if we're talking to empty nesters, let's show them an, images that have to do with people that are at that stage of their life. And let's talk about things that are important at that stage of their life. And if it's people that are just buying their first home, it would be the same thing, but apply to them. And so I think a lot of salespeople are afraid of automation because they think that it's going to be, um, you know, too generic. And I think we've all heard, like, if you're speaking to everyone, you're speaking to no one. Correct. So um, what are some of the things um, that we can do as salespeople to really identify, like, who, who is our potential ideal customer? 
Um, are there specific questions that you recommend we ask to figure out who that person is? Sure. Many times if I'm following up with somebody, if I've just met them for the first time, and let me, let me clarify your question. Are you asking about follow, uh, questions that we would ask in person, or are you asking about questions that we might send out through an email? So I think my question is, how do we figure out who this ideal customer is in order for us to tailor the message to them? We kind of have to figure out this person in our minds, right? And yes. maybe it's not, I mean, if we can actually, the way I do it is if I can actually have a person who bought from me and I tailor my messages completely to that one person, because I know they're very much a representation of all of my other buyers, and I'm not afraid to be very specific with my messaging because I know that it's going to apply to, you know, majority of my buyer profile and those that it doesn't apply to necessarily, you know, I'm not, I'm not too worried about that because sure. if I can convert majority of them and appeal to them with that message, um, that's what I'm worried about. So I guess, how do we um, identify, how do we figure out who this person is if, maybe we're um, starting out in a new community um, and we don't have any sales yet. Um, how do we figure out who our buyer is if we haven't necessarily converted anybody yet? So do you have um, like an exercise that we could go through? Is there a list of questions that we could answer so that we can at least create our ideal customer? Um, I think the more specific you can get with that, the better it is. It's, it's brilliant. And I like what you say about focusing on a past customer, but you threw in that little wrinkle of, let's say you're in a new community. So let's go with that. What you're speaking about is what I call a customer avatar. Yes. And uh, you've heard that term, customer avatar? Yeah. So for those of us who are not marketing <laughs> geniuses, let's, uh, let's break it down. So what is a customer avatar? Can you, can you define that term for everyone, please? Absolutely. So one thing that you said that was brilliant, is you, you know that you think of having a conversation with one person at a time entirely correct it when you, that's and this is where you want to develop what you what is called the avatar now the avatar is a fictional person doesn't exist but it is truly your ideal customer and you want to think about that customer and i actually have i actually have a mind map that i go through this exercise when i'm doing a customer avatar and it has a picture of somebody's head on there. And, and I start, and I ask myself, what is this person thinking? What are, what are, the, what are the questions they're asking themselves in their head? If you can think about that, you know, the, this, the key to winning marketing is to really be answering the questions that people are already answering in their heads. So think about this. What are people that come to this new community? What are they going to be asking? And now you might have to develop multiple customer avatars because if it's a young family, then they're going to want to know things about, you know, things for the, the, the kids or where are the schools, where are the playgrounds, is it safe, things like that. If it's, uh, and, and if somebody that is an empty nester is coming in, they might have other concerns. They might have concerns about, uh, is it safe or is it quiet or, or whatnot. And so you want to think about this and it's okay to have multiple customer avatars because you're going to be dealing with different types of customers in a community, but you so want to be thinking. Go ahead. Sorry. So let me ask you this question, Steve. So then when it comes to automation, um, do we then have multiple messages for those multiple customer avatars? Is that what you would recommend doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. okay. And, and more than multiple messages, what I would call multiple message tracks or sequences. All right. Now, and if we can stick with our example here, you know, let's say we want to, the key to the, Follow-up is a key. I teach flawless follow-up. And most people, or most salespeople, this is what they can do immediately to improve their, their closing is following up. And the truth is, where most people get overwhelmed is when they don't have a system and they don't automate their follow-up and they try to do everything personally because, you know, how, how many people come through a home in a day? Oh my goodness. You know, that's something that I do all the time. So I actually, um, a lot of builders still use the piece of paper to sign customers in like the open house. And then I remember sitting there on a Sunday night, 
um, you know, five o'clock at night, like you're done, you know, you're, uh, you're wiped from the weekend, like you're emotionally exhausted because you've been spewing kind of like the same thing over and over. And you've been talking to so many customers and everyone started to get mixed up in your mind. And now you got to go through this pile and enter that pile into your CRM. And then you got to follow up with each customer. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I said, there's got to be a better system than that. And so now what I do is I use iPad. Um, so I got rid of the paper altogether because one, you can never read what they wrote on it, right? Half the mm -hmm. time the handwriting is wrong or they, they put in the wrong information. So at least if they're giving me accurate information, I want to make sure I can read it. So they're mm -hmm. entering it themselves on the iPad and that feeds automatically into my CRM without me having to re-enter that, doing all that manual labor, it's so much better, right? And then mm -hmm. take it one step further is the minute they leave my model, you know, an hour later, an automated message goes out to them saying, thank you so much for coming in to visit. Here's a link to the model home, yada, yada. Let me know if you have any questions. It, they think I'm on top of it. Exactly. And there you go. <laughs> and I've done nothing. I'm so glad you said that. Okay, so you have a system, you have a process, which you I said do. at the very beginning, that, that you understand that. And that's where so, and how much better is that than sitting at home on a Sunday night being so tired and having to do that? Oh my gosh. You know, and in, in the beginning, it definitely took some time to set it up, but it's so worth it. It's right. definitely worth it. I think um, I attribute a lot of my sales success to having that system. Right. All right, so, so may I ask you some more questions about your system? Please do. Can we use it as an example? Absolutely. All right, so this is perfect. You follow up immediately. You say thank you and the people, and you make a huge impression. Better than 90% of the other homes that they went to, you are standing out as a professional better than, you know, nine out of 10 of the others right there, so good for you. Tell me what happens next. Do you, the, is there any more follow-up scheduled in there? Yes, yeah, so then I mix it up. So usually um, in my follow-up system, the next step is to actually make a phone call. So it prompts me to make a phone call. Good. Now, the CRM that I use, um, I actually have um, an app for it. So it's very convenient because I can see it on my phone. So I can just dial for, say, I saw 20 people this weekend. I can just go boom, 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 quickly make those phone calls leave a message or not leave a message and it automatically records in the CRM what happened. So Beautiful. once that step is complete, then it prompts the next step. The next step may be um, it's going to send another email and this, this time email may say, um, you know, you may be um, overwhelmed with a thought of financing your new home and, you know, uh, kind of dispelling the myths of financing new construction that you may need a construction loan or this and that and may have my loan officer's information in it saying how easy it is to finance the new home, whatever it may be. And again, the next step may be it prompts me to send them a text message. Mm. So, and it's kind of like a chain reaction. And then I do have to do some interaction, obviously. I mean, I would love to have Anya making, like <laughs> automated Anya making phone calls for me. <laughs> Maybe that's in the future. So at this point, I'm basically making phone calls periodically and um, sending text messages. Uh, but I don't actually send any of the emails. All the emails are automated. I, well, this is terrific because what you're, you're explaining several key things here. First of all, I like what you're doing. You're educating. You, people need to make a decision. And so you, you, you are addressing what could be an objection, what could be a fear, which is financing. So you already know, we already spoke, this is perfect. You, you, you know this because you've thought out this customer avatar. You know what they're thinking. Can I afford this house? Can we even qualify for this house? Can we get a mortgage for this house? So you're educating them and you're also helping to alleviate those fears because you're telling them, look, we've got a whole department who can help you with this. You know, we, we work with people all the time. We, we know people that are in your situation. Now, so to further that, what, uh, what, what I might do is I might put a series of links in an email like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the links are designed for a couple things. Mainly it's designed to give you feedback. It's also designed to keep them engaged. 
But if you have an email about financing, then what you might do is you might put two to three scenarios, links to different scenarios. So you, you might ask, hey, if you're a first time home builder, you could click here to get information about our first time home builder. You know, if you, you know, if you're worried about coming in with enough cash, then click here. If you have a house to sell before you can buy our house, click here. Now, I'm doing this from the top of my, my head, but what it's, what's happening is two things. Number one, you're helping those people get engaged in the conversation. Do you remember those, those pick a path books from when we were little and you could read a book and you could, and it would say, you know, if we were reading a, a, uh, um, an adventure and, you know, and, and it says, uh, you get to a point in, and you have two weapons you could pick up. You could pick up a sword or you could pick up a shield. Which do you pick up? Okay. And then depending on which one you pick up, it says, okay, if you pick up the sword, go to page 92. If you pick up the shield, go to page you know, 37. And this is a, called a pick a path book, right? Our automation becomes that because based upon their decision, based upon they click this link, what's happening? We know we're, we can get information. So we are starting to develop a picture for what's going on in their head. What are the questions in their head? And this is going to help us gather that intelligence, I call it, the feedback, so that when we get to them, we know what those questions are and we could get past those questions, get past those objectives so that we can close the sale. Mm -hmm. I love that. So it's not only automation, but you're also um, segmenting them further, right? Yeah, you're absolutely. figuring out, okay, you're A, you're B, so maybe you have a customer avatar, but then you're getting more and more specific as they're traveling down this um, path that you have created for them. That's right. And that could help you. That could help you be in the right place at the right time, because I'm sure that many of the people listening to this podcast, they run into people who are out and they're, they're looky lose, right? They're out and they're out looking. They really, they're not ready to buy now, but they're maybe six months from now, maybe a year from now. And they're, and the, and the, you, the, what you want to do is you want your system to keep them engaged. You're not going to turn your back on them. You're not going to ignore them, but you also don't want to take your, your personal time, which you, you know, is not scalable. You can only be at one place at one time. So if you're spending your time trying to reach a person that you know is not going to buy for a year or, or, you know, or whatnot, then you're, you're taking your time away from somebody that you could potentially be selling a home to right now. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you're probably going to forget to call back that person a year from now when they might be in the market. And maybe something happens. Maybe he gets a new, maybe, you know, he or she, or they both get a new job in six months and that changes their situation. So they said, well, we're going to be in the market for a year, but something happened that changed and they ended up being in the market in six months and you call back in a year and they say, oh no, we bought a house six months ago. Yeah. And what I love about that is that, um, you can set up that automation system to um, kind of keep up the relationship, right? So maybe, okay, so they're not ready to buy for a year. So I can create a bucket of people who are getting this email from me. And maybe it doesn't have to be, you know, too often, but say once a month, they're getting an email from me that is educating them about our homes, um, especially if you can show them photos of um, your homes and you're kind of building that emotional tie-in, that familiarity, so that when they're ready to buy, who do they think of? They think of the girl who followed up for the last year, right? Because I'm in their inbox. So how often would you recommend that we follow up with somebody who is not a hot prospect? Like if they're not a hot buyer right now, but a year from now, they may be purchasing. How frequently should we be following up? This is a brilliant question. Um, and, and, and I love what you just said also. I have a process. Here's a tip. Here's a tip. Everybody listening can do this today. I create a message, and I call this my flawless follow-up forever funnel. <laughs> it's a flawless follow-up forever funnel. I like Fs, right? All right. So basically, it's about every 45 days. And I vary that because I don't want it to come, I don't want it to be so perfect that you can count on an email from Steve at 8.30 a.m. every 45 days. So I might stagger that a little bit. So I develop five or six messages, and they're very informal. 
and they're very conversational. So for me, I would say, hi, it's Steve, and I'm following up because you came to visit our home in our community, and I knew you weren't quite ready, but I just want to touch base and see where you're at right now. Are, you know, are you still in the market? Will you be in the market? And you could just ask them that question. And if you do it very informal like that, what's going to happen many times is they may hit reply. Hey, Steve, thanks. You know what? We've actually sped up our timetable. We're, yeah, we're actually back in the market again. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to know. And if you do this every you know, 45 days, every six weeks or so, you're going to be on top of it. And what you said is 100% correct. When you keep in touch with people like that and you are in their inbox, you're also getting subliminally in their mind, you become the only logical solution. And, you know, they might even call you, even if, even if it's not for a home in your community, let's say, but what if they call and say, you know, Anya, you're the best. We really like you. Can you help us find a home maybe in a different community in your organization? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I think that's um, some of the resistance from the sales reps comes from that point that, okay, so I'm selling in the community right now. They're telling me they're not ready to buy for six months. I'm going to be sold out in two months. So I'm just going to take this piece of paper. I'm going to shred it and throw it away because guess what? They're not my buyer. Well, what I think a lot of people fail to realize is that you can create almost a bucket and maybe they're not going to be right for this community, but say like some kind of a prospecting bucket where you're keeping in touch with these people and you know, so next time you go to a new community, guess what? You have a list of people that you can email and say, hey, a great, you know, I have some exciting news. Um, we're opening this new community. This is where it is. This is what we're offering. Please um, help us spread the message. And if you have any friends or family looking for a home, please let them know, right? So this person yeah. getting my message, even if they're not buying, even if this community is not right for them, but guess what? They have a brother-in-law who's in a market and they were looking in, in this specific area and boom, they refer. So I think a lot of people are very short-sighted, concentrating specifically on point A right now. I am in this community. What can I do right now to sell a house this month? And they're not thinking long-term. And a long-term is how do I cast the net and how do I keep relationships going, not only with people who visited and didn't buy, but that also applies to people who did buy from me, right? Because now maybe they just bought and they're not going to buy a year from now, but guess what? They have friends, they have family who are most likely going to be looking for houses. And if you provided a great customer experience for this buyer, they're going to be more likely to recommend you and your company to their friends and family. So um, I think that's, kind of like, you know, a lot of the sales reps are different in that sense from real estate agents because real estate agents, I think, are much more savvy in that. But it's the sales reps for a builder, we always think like, okay, this is my community, this is this, this month, and we're sometimes are very short-sighted in that, unfortunately. You, you're, you hit the nail on the head. And, and I have to tell you, because as you know, as, I, as you mentioned in reading my, my bio, I work with businesses, all industries all over the world. And it's not just, this is not just uh, a situation for the, the new home industry. Salespeople all over the world, they, they are focusing right now, what can they close today? You know, they got that hunter mentality and oh, you, what, I need to kill something and bring it home to feed my family. Okay, that's great. Okay, but the reality is you also need to feed them next month. And so you, you, you need to be preparing for the hunt for next month as well. Uh, and so there, we have to have a little bit of farming in us in, in, in that respect. And, and a lot of salespeople don't like to do that. I don't like to do that. And that's why I built these systems. It's not a sexy thing, you know, there's no glory in that. So, um, but I think that's where automation is so important because once you set it up, it's said and done, right? All you do is you hit a button, you enter them as that particular person, and then they're getting it from you. So it, yeah, it, it may be a little bit of a pain in the butt and, and first to set it up, but once it's set up. Well, it's magical. And, and I'll tell you, if you're a salesperson listening to this podcast, you, you know, 
it's really the best thing you can do because you could be building lifelong customers that you could take with you from community to community. They're really, you know, they're really investing in you. All right. So that's important. So that's why this could help you. Now, if you're an executive with a home builder that's listening to this podcast, and this is really a wonderful podcast, Dan, Anya, because it talks to everybody. But these are tools that are readily available that will make your salespeople more successful. And it will bond and build rapport to those home builder, those home owners, uh, because you're going to want to sell them new homes in, in, in the future. You don't want to just sell them a home today. You want to be their home builder for life, right? It sounds like a cliche, but it can be a reality. And that's what these systems can do. And here's the good news. It's still at the point where most salespeople and most businesses aren't doing this. And so you really differentiate yourself. You really rise above the competition by doing this. And if you're afraid that you can't automate and be personal, uh, I, I know Anya can tell you from experience and I can tell you from experience, couldn't be further from the truth. I get people all the time that tell me that I took the time to learn them and know them better than anybody else they'd ever met. And guess what? It wasn't me personally, it was my system. Would you find that to be true? Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree with you. It's People like the attention that you're giving them, especially with something big like a home purchase. They want to feel appreciated. They want to feel like you care. They want to feel like you're following up and you want them to buy from you. And yeah, absolutely. The, uh, and especially if we can create a split system, you know, choose A or choose B, um, that's, that's brilliant. Um, what do you think about incorporating video into um, messages? So instead of, you know, uh, links, like put in a video with, okay, if you want to learn, if you want to learn about first time home buyer financing, here's a video for you. So do you find that video messages are being open more frequently than text messages? Well, I, I never put a video directly into an email. Uh, I will, I will put a link in an email that goes to a video. Mm -hmm. um, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, sure. Something like that. Or I mean, you could, you could certainly embed the video into the email as well, but I think it's probably with a lot of email providers easier to just provide a link because sometimes it, it just won't go through. You want to provide that, that is correct. That is correct. Now there's a trick where we can make, we could put a little animated picture in there that looks like a segment of a video. So it might look like me talking or it might look and it says click here to watch the rest of the video. That's a good thing to do, but that's, that's a technical thing. I won't get into too much here, but absolutely. People love videos. You have to realize that today, probably two thirds of the engagement that, that you are having with somebody is, is done right there on that cell phone. Mm -hmm. And, and, and people, they do like to watch video. Here's something, Here's something that is staggering about video. And, and most people that are watching videos, this, this sounds so weird, but most people that are watching videos on their phone today, guess what? They're watching it with the volume off. Mm -hmm. How you, and you know this, you know this from being on LinkedIn, you know this from being on Facebook, and now Google, now Google in their Chrome browser is not putting the audio automatically on on a video. So somebody comes to your website and there's a video playing, guess what? They can't hear it. So your video, your video strategy has to take that into account. So you might want to use subtitles. You might want to use bigger calls to action. But absolutely, people love video, and you should have it. And then just simply by putting a link in an email that goes to a video, once again, we could tag and segment people and find out what they're interested in by did they click on that video or not. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, we talked a little bit about uh, the person, right? So we figured out who our ideal customer avatar is. We talked about tailoring the message to that person based on who they are. Um, so let's talk about the last two, the place and the time. Huh. So um, obviously there are a lot of recommendations on when's the best day of the week to send an email, um, you know, when the messages get opened the most. Do you subscribe to that? Like what, do you, what are your thoughts on the timing of your emails? Is there a particular day of the week that you usually send your emails? Um, you know, Saturday, Sunday, yes or no? Some people won't call prospect on a Saturday, Sunday. Like, what are your thoughts on that? This is all over the board. And it, it really, it, it varies from 
person to person and industry to industry and whatever you do. So you, this is part of you knowing your audience. Um, you, you know, and, and so I, no, I cannot tell you a one size fits all. And if you're reading any studies out there, the, the study is inherently biased because it really depends on who they're talking to. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I talk to some businesses where they're, they get the majority of their business on the weekends, others during the week. So I, I don't subscribe to that. What I, what I like to do, I like to do my follow-up based upon the recency of the action. I mean, if somebody followed up, you, you demonstrated this brilliantly. If somebody leaves a model home, you, fill, you follow up right away, okay? It's a recent action, you follow up right away. And I would follow up frequently. I might even follow up daily for the next week. Now, as time goes on, I'll tailor that off. As the recency gets further and further away, I won't contact them as often. Um, but, you know, I'll do that. And I might stagger the, the time. And you see, you can't know because, you know, what if that person works a night shift? Or what if they're, my daughter just got a job as a nurse? She works, she works 12-hour days for four days in a row, then she's off for three days. So, you, you know, when she reads her email, it's going to be different from the next person. So that's why I don't subscribe to that at all. Okay. And what about place? So obviously, I think um, in a digital world, it's all about, again, where your customers are hanging out. So I think you have to be cognizant of what methods of follow-up, right? So is it a phone call? Is it a text message? Are text messages appropriate? Um, Is it an email? Are people actually opening email? Do you write a physical letter? So how do you kind of, I guess, think through this process, if you can help us kind of decide um, how do we land on one or the other? Do we mix it up? Like, what's, what's your suggestion here? (laughs) Yes, 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 and yes. And it really is the same. And this is a beautiful thing. We call this repurposing, okay? Mm -hmm. Because everybody is different. I just said that, you know, two thirds of the people are gathering are, are responding to things on the phone. Well, that's true, but that means one third aren't. So, you know, if we just focus on one thing, we could miss the others. Uh, you did not include what, what is, a lot of people are having success right now with Facebook chatbot, messenger, you know, messenger chatbots, mm-hmm. which is kind of like text messaging, but it's not, you know, and, and, and I suppose LinkedIn will probably go that way fairly soon also, as well as the others. So, you, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about doing what we're doing is, you say mix it up, you could actually build that into the process. This all goes back to the process. It all goes back to the systems and you could hit people on all those different channels. And what happens is the more you touch them, you know, digitally or or personally or whatever, the more you're bonding, the more you're building rapport, the more you are cementing that relationship above your competition and above all other communities. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think the more you can make it personal. So I'll give you an example. So I recently signed up for an online course and I've taken, you know, many online courses because I'm constantly trying to learn new things to help me sell more homes and to get better. And um, I think I'm just hooked on, you know, learning, learning, learning. So, but this person um, you know, I got a package in the, in the mail and um, I was not expecting a package. So when I opened it up, I was so shocked to, to, to get it. I mean, they send me a, a personal um, handwritten thank you note and they added um, brownies. Like there were three yeah. um, gourmet brownies and I was just blown away. I mean, I was like, oh my, I can't believe that this person took the time and I'm sure it wasn't them personally, but whoever on their team took the time to send this to me. And it made me feel so special that nobody else has done that before. So if you think about little things like that, like goes back to even a handwritten note, like say this prospect left your model. And again, you can have your assistant sit down and write out thank you cards, right? Just write all of them out real quick, get them in the mail. And how many salespeople do you think are actually following up with a handwritten thank you card? And how long did it take to do it? I mean, a minute? Um, so I think it's always like finding, yeah, finding those like little things. And maybe it's not a thank you card. Like 
just creative ways to follow up that touch somebody in, in a special way. They think like, wow, nobody's ever done that before. Yeah, it's a beautiful example. Yeah, because remember, it goes back to like, people don't remember what you said, but they remember how you made them feel. I think that's the saying, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, if you can incorporate into your follow up that making feel somebody very special, I think that's, that goes a long way, so. And of course, nobody knows that better than home builders, right? I mean, that, that's why the home builders know the importance of emotion in selling a home. That's, that's mm -hmm. why kitchens look the way they look and bathrooms look the way they look, right? So we, we Absolutely. the home builders understand the importance of emotion. So what you said is a brilliant example. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Steve, I like to ask what you know, what, what what are you reading? What are some of your favorite books that you can recommend? I know you've written quite a few books yourself. So, um, if you don't mind actually telling us about some of the books you've written, I'd love to learn more about that. Well. <laughs> Um, many and, and many courses as well. Uh, so the, you, you, my, my first court, my first book, well, I shouldn't say it was actually my second book, but the one that got the most popularity is called the back end blueprint. Back and end blueprint. Back end blueprint. And it's about the back end of the marketing funnel. It's where I introduced this concept of flawless follow-up. And my process, I've got a process, I call it my leak proof funnel system. It's an acronym, L-E-A-C. We can go on for a long time with all that, but uh, um, so you could look that up. I recently just released a course on LinkedIn called LinkedIn Dominance. And um, that's, that's been very, very that's popular right now. That's doing very, very well. So um, it's, for me, it's all about, for businesses, I wanna help businesses find more prospects and quickly convert them into paying customers. Mm -hmm. But then I want to maximize the value of that customer. So I want them to buy, I want them to buy multiple homes from you. Okay. I want them to refer their family and friends so that one sale brings you many sales. And so these are all the types of systems that I, that I talk about in my, in my book. So if I talk about LinkedIn, it's not just about how to get on LinkedIn and build a nice profile. It's how do you meet somebody on LinkedIn, convert them into a client, and then maximize the value of that client so you do more business with them and they bring you more referrals and so forth. Awesome. And what about non-Steve books? Um, are there <laughs> any particular favorites that you have, especially you know, being a salesperson and marketer at heart? Like, is there any books that made an impact on you that you'd recommend? Well, you know, I, I'm pretty nerdy and I don't know how interesting people will, will find things. And, 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 and I these days I'm engaging much more online with individuals, individuals that I just, I, I'm very passionate about what they teach about. Um, I've always been a fan of Dan Kennedy's a legend. I've always been a fan of him. I've always been a fan of copywriters. I like people like Ray Edwards. I like people like uh, uh, Todd Brown is a brilliant marketer. So I'm more a fan of people than, than these days. Um, I, you know, I guess cause I have, you know, it's, the way I consume information these days is a whole lot different than I did just a few years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I think most of us are, and that's why I'm doing this podcast, right? Right, right. <laughs> and I, and, I, and it's, I really have enjoyed it. You're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, is there a CRM system that's your favorite? Yes, but I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, the, you are correct that... Um, um, I, I actually am more of a fan, not of a straight CRM, but all really of um, marketing automation. And, and many companies that are using CRMs are not getting the most out of it. And that's because CRMs aren't really built for that marketing process. They're really just built to house data. So the bottom line is, um, I actually have a company that I'm, a, that I'm a part of. This is my company that I own. It's called FunnelKits, funnelkits.com. And it's a marketing automation platform it is actually built on the front end of, of a company called Active Campaign, which I think you've probably heard of. Yes. So, um, so the reason why I like this is because here's what I found dealing with companies and doing this over and over again, is that many times what they're looking for is fairly similar. Uh, the processes aren't really changing. They're looking for how do you meet somebody and get them to buy my product? Mm -hmm. Or the people listen to this podcast, the product is home. For other people, it's, you know, I've done this for jewelers. I've done this for restaurants selling cheeseburgers. I've done this for 
people in the oil industry selling multi-million dollar oil equipment. The process doesn't change. And so the beautiful thing about what I've developed here is I've developed a, a whole suite of, of funnels. And these funnels are designed for the different part of the marketing prospect or mar marketing um, diagram here, the blueprint, if you will. So how do we follow up with somebody? We meet them for the first time. How do we follow up with a cold lead? How do we get more referrals? How do we get more testimonials? So the bottom line is I build these out and then through this funnelkits.com, I can now engage with companies and quickly implement and much more effectively and efficiently for them putting this into place. Sure. Um, and Steve, if somebody wanted to follow you and all your, um, you know, uh, I guess, wisery, I don't know if that's the word, <laughs> <laughs> learn all about the uh, funnels, where do you hang out online? What's the best place to connect with you? Well, I do have my own website and it is steverosenbaum.com. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to give a gift to the folks that came. We, we talked about that perfect sales storm and it's a great story. And you can take that story and use it as an allegory for whatever it is you sell. So if we could, let's just send people to steverosenbaum.com. How about slash Anya? How about that? That works for me. And you know, I'll slash A-N-Y-A. Yes. And what I'll do is I'll put up a nice welcome page there. Uh, uh, they can listen to the story. And I'll also put some sort of a gift there as well. Awesome. I'd appreciate it. And you guys, I also have some very exciting um, news. I um, I think as we talked with Steve, um, process is something that I pride myself in. So I'm working on a program currently. Um, so if you guys want to learn more about that, check it out uh, by going to anyachristiansen.com forward slash tools. Once it's ready, um, I'll definitely let you know more about it. It's basically all about the process for follow up to what you're, what you're talking about, Steve, I think. Um, I just wrote that down. I can't wait. <laughs> I know it's, uh, I, you know, it's, it's crazy because I talked to so many people in this industry and nobody seems to have that automated process in place and it's old note cards, old pieces of paper, and it's time, time to get on with the program. So, um, well, Steve, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. I appreciate your time and, um, I look forward to, um, seeing what you'll put together for us. And, um, you know, I'm sure um, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Anya. Thank you for having me. And everybody, thanks for listening. This is a great podcast. Make sure you check out all the episodes. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. <laughs> 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 all right. I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a good thanks, one. Thanks, Anya. Bye-bye.